So last time we talked a little bit about uh, the basic structure um, and some of the major characters uh, in Omeros. So today what I want to do is follow up on that by give you, giving you a couple of strategies uh, for reading the poem. Um, this is probably not going to seem 100% coherent, um, in part because my primary goal here is just trying to give you a couple of ways in uh, without forcing a particular interpretation of the poem. So, it might help if we first try to think about um, the poem as an example of a particular form or genre. Um, and the clearest analog we find in literary history is the epic. Right, so an epic we know is a long narrative poem, right, typically about heroes and gods participating in world shaping events. Right, so when we think about epic, there are a few common features that we find in most epics, right? First, that the hero is a figure of great national or cosmic importance. You know, think of like a, a demigod king like Gilgamesh um, or, you know, a, 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 you know, a superhuman hero like Achilles, right? On whose fate the, uh, you know, on whose shoulders the fate of the entire Greek army rests, right? The setting is typically vast in scale um, in an epic, often international, global, or cosmic. In uh, Milton's Paradise Lost, for example, um, the whole of creation is the setting for the epic. Um, in Dante's Divine Comedy, right, the entire plan of the afterlife is the setting for the epic. Um, the Odyssey ranges around the entire Mediterranean, right? So the hero in an epic will typically travel widely The action will typically involve extraordinary, sometimes superhuman deeds. Right, think um, Odysseus's blinding of the Cyclops. Achilles killing of Hector. Right, you know, Gilgamesh running through the tunnel, um, you know, through the underground tunnel that the sun comes down at night. Gods and supernatural beings are often a big part um, of the action, an active part of the action um, in a traditional epic. The epic is narrated or written in an elevated style that is somehow distinct from normal speech. Right, so when the poet recites, right, you know based on the rhythms and cadences of his speech, that this is epic. This is not normal conversation. Um, and the epic often begins with the declaration of theme and the invocation of the muse, right? You know, and uh, asking sort of these goddesses of artistic inspiration um, to come and possess the poet, right? And, you know, uh, let the, you know, let that inspiration flow forth in his verse. We get some of the, we get we'll get we'll see some of these features in Amoros, but not all. Um, the narrative also tends to begin in an epic it, at the middle of a critical point in the action, right? So, in the Iliad, for example, uh, we are not introduced to Agamemnon, Achilles, Odysseus, Ajax at the beginning of the war, right? The war has already been going on for ten years and the generals have had a dispute, and Achilles has gone off in a snit to his tent. So we're getting, we, we start in the middle of the story rather than at the beginning. You will also often find epic catalogs of important characters, places, or items. Or just Writers of ancient epic love lists. Think of Homer's catalog of ships um, and their captains uh, in the Iliad. 
Now, how does Almoros measure up uh, in this respect? Almoros does share many of the features of classical epic. Um, and of course, um, it's easy to argue that Walcott is consciously adopting these particular figures or adapting them to his own needs. So the heroes are not superhuman, right? Decidedly not superhuman, right? They're fishermen, an unemployed maid, a retired soldier, right? The major figures in the poem are ordinary people, ordinary citizens of the island of St. Lucia. Some of the things that they manage to do are extraordinary. The feelings they manage to inspire in others, in the case of Helen, for example, um, are extraordinary. But the characters themselves are not in any way supernatural. We do have a global setting, right? Most of the poem focuses on that tiny little corner of the world, St. Lucia, um, where Walcott was born. But it ranges from St. Lucia to the great cities of North America and Europe, right? Boston, Toronto, Dublin, London, Paris, you know, uh, the poetic persona, the Walcott-like eye in the poem, visits all sorts of places, right? He goes imaginatively to the Great Plains um, in the 19th century. Achille goes back to Africa um, and meets his imaginary father, right? and brings back the traditional dances. Um, so the setting varies here widely, not just in place, but also in time, right? Characters go back and forth in time. The narrative goes back and forth in time, much as the characters range all over different places. We do have supernatural activity as well in uh, the activities of Ma Kilman. Uh, the village wise woman who heals Philoctet's wound and also Major Plunkett's. And in Achille's journey into the past and his return via a slave ship in the Middle Passage. The swift, uh, the seabird that we see figuring in the poem fairly frequently is the closest thing we get um, probably to um, a divine intermediary in the poem for reasons we'll talk about a little bit later on. So I just wanted to note this now, and we'll pick up on the swift as an image a little bit later. Um, it is written in an elevated style, right? It's written in a terza rima form that, as we discussed last time, imitates that of Dante's Divine Comedy. So he's consciously writing in the style of an earlier epic poet. And the narrative also begins at a sort of transitional point. Right? We have the fishermen making their canoes, Helen has just been fired by the Plunkets, and is leaving Achille for Hector. Right? These paintings, by the way, most of the paintings that I put in the PowerPoint presentation here are of the scenes of St. Lucian life that were done either by Walcott or by his twin brother Roderick. Now, epic is often about right, so the origins of a place or of a nation, right? Epic is a kind of building story, not for a character, but for a country, for a people. And so it might help if we think about Omeros in those terms. Right, so this is a painting that represents the character Helen, who shares her name with the island. Right, St. Lucia has also, at various times, been called Helena, and was known as the Helen of the West Indies, given the number of times it changed hands between the British, the Dutch, and the French. Um, we see efforts throughout the poem to decolonize St. Lucia, right? to make St. Lucia something more than an ex-British colony, to give it an identity of its own. Right? 
we see this partly through the, re the resurrection of the past, right? Plunkett's attempts to write the island's history, his gift to Helen, the woman and the island. Uh, we see this in the play's interest in the story of Catherine Weldon and the ghost dance the movement. Um, the ghost dance, if you don't know, uh, was, uh, it was a religious movement among the Sioux um, in the um, Great Plains in the 19th century. And the basic idea behind the ghost dance was that um, performance of the dance um, and belief in the tenets of the movement uh, would bring back the world the way it was uh, before Europeans had come to the Americas. Right, so it would, it would bring back the buffalo. It would bring back, um, you know, it would bring back the tribe's old ways. This is why the U.S. government outlawed it. Um, we also see the resurrection of the past in Achille's return from Africa. Right, he comes back um, much like the classical hero of epic often comes back. From a, uh, from a journey to the underworld with new knowledge or new information to share with mankind, right? Um, Ashiel comes back with a kind of memory of Africa and a memory of tribal dances uh, that he then teaches to others. We can also see some of this in the uh, narrative personas, visions of the ghost of his father. We also see attempts at the creation of a new community. Right, we have Philip Tett's um, efforts during the election. Right, he actually seems to be the most active character um, in the affairs of the island itself. We have Achille's acceptance of Helen's child with his former rival Hector. Right. Helen is pregnant at the end of the poem. The baby is Hector's, but Achille is going to accept it and raise it as his own. Right, so the formation of a new family that is representative of a new way forward for the island. And finally, Ma Kilman's healing of Philip Tett's leg wound and Plunkett's um, sort of mysterious head wound. Uh, which can only be cured after the death of Plunkett's wife. We'll talk a little bit about Plunkett and his wife um, in a moment. In fact, when we discuss how the poem deals with the last traces of imperial presence um, in the Caribbean, particularly in St. Lucia. So first off, um, in its descriptions of the Plunkett's home. Uh, now, it's very important that we remember that while well, Dennis Plunkett, the Sergeant Major, right, we, he's referred to as Major Plunkett throughout most of the poem, but we find out by the end that he was a Sergeant Major, not an actual Major. So he was a high-ranking enlisted man, not an officer. But it's very important that while well, Dennis is English, Maud, his wife, is Irish. And much of the imagery associated with her is the imagery of Victorian imperialism. Um, we have a good sense of this if we look on page 261, where we have the beginning of that sort of catalog of imperial souvenirs in their home. Um, Maud is yeah, associated with a, a kind of Victorian colonialist ideal, a Victorian colonialist relationship um, that mirrors Ireland's status as a former colony of, uh, of the United Kingdom, right? Um, Ireland 
was undergoing its own independent struggles in the late Victorian era. Um, de officially declared independence in the early 1920s. So the relationship between Dennis and Maud, right, is that kind of old, is, mirrors that old colonial relationship. Um, it's also important to note that their marriage has produced no children. Um, it seems that one of the side effects of Plunkett's wound is to render him sexually impotent. So he's also associated um, at various points um, with the figure of the Fisher King from the Grail legends, you know, wounded in the thigh um, and thus um, unable to guarantee the fertility of his lands and domains. We also have the international travels of the unnamed narrator to various centers of European empire. Um, one section I would have you pay particular attention to is like, uh, not because it was the center of empire, but because it was the center of imperial administration um, in Ireland, right? It was the center of British government in Ireland. Uh, pay close attention to the section in which the narrator visits Dublin. Um, I'm sort of curious to see what you think of that and what's going on there. We have Plunkett's historical research. So what he is trying to dig up is the history primarily of a battle that took place during the, Ameri the um, American Revolutionary War called the Battle of the Saints. So this is a three-day naval battle that took place uh, over the 9th through the 12th of April in 1872. 19, um, not 1872. 1772. Yeah, 1772. The British Navy, under Admiral Rodney, thwarted a joint French-Spanish invasion of Jamaica. So, during the Battle of the Saints, the British managed to successfully defend their colonies in the, uh, in the West Indies from an invasion by other powers. So the Battle of the Saints is very much closely identified with the promotion of British imperial power in the region, right? This was the sort of cementing their hold over St. Lucia and Jamaica and other such dominions. So through his research, Plunkett finds an imaginary son, right, a midshipman by the name of Plunkett, who died in the battle under Romney's command. And Ashiel finds his ancestor Afalave and a slave renamed Ashiel by Rodney. Right, so we have Plunkett and Ashiel both digging into this history in various ways. In fact, um, Achille has, is inspired to imaginatively visit after, well, I say inspired, he's actually lying in his boat dying of sunstroke. Um, the reason he's out in the boat in the first place is because he's been diving for artifacts from the Battle of the Saints um, to sell to people who want to start a museum. And also to tourists who purchase such trinkets, right? This is an artist's rendering of the Battle of the Saints. So, probably one of the most important themes was while we're on the subject of Achille and his rediscovery of his reputative father, Afolave, is the idea of an identity taken away and then restored. So Achille really kind of finds him, really kind of finds himself and finds his history in this journey into the past, back to Africa. Um, this picture is of 
uh, a traditional dance of the Dogon people of Mali in West Africa. So when Ashil and Afolabe have their first encounter, um, Afolabe talks a great deal about the importance of names and of naming. Right? He says to Ashil, a name means something. The qualities desired in a son and even a girl child. So even the shadows who called you expected one virtue, since every name is a blessing. Since I am remembering the hope I had for you as a child. Unless the sound means nothing, then you would be nothing. Did they think you were nothing in that other world? So what Afalabe is upset about here is that his son has had the name he was given, the name that he gave to him, stripped away and replaced by a pair of foreign syllables that don't mean anything to them. Right? They're talking to the taking away of language, um, the taking away of the ability to name something. Right? <clears throat> when you no longer have the power to name your environment, you know, objects in your environment, um, when you no, no longer have the power to name your own children in your own language, right, you have given that power, that, that power has been taken from you by someone else, right? Your relationship to your environment changes, right? It's always going to be mediated through someone else's language. And that someone else then has power not only over your environment, but over you. And their language means nothing to you. It's meaningless syllables, right? So when it says, did, you, did they think you were nothing in that other world, right? He is referencing his son's relatively lowly status in the Creole culture of St. Lucia. It continues, no man loses his shadow except it is in the night, and even then his shadow is hidden, not lost. At the glow of sunrise, he stands on his own name in that light. When he walks down to the river with the other fishermen, his shadow stretches in the morning and yawns, but you, if you are content with not knowing what our names mean, then I am not Afalabe, your father, and you look through my body as the light looks through a leaf. I am not here or a shadow, and you, nameless son, are only the ghost of a name. Why haven't I missed you, my son, until you were lost? Are you the smoke from a fire that never burned? So, <clears throat> Ashiel's disconnection from his roots has turned him into, according to his, uh, you know, his ghost father's logic, a kind of shadow, a kind of ghost, right? A kind of non-entity, a non-being, right? If your name means nothing, then you are nothing. And so Ashiel's task in Africa is to rediscover the meaning of his name, to rediscover his cultural roots, and to bring those back to St. Lucia in order to inspire the birth of a new community that is more deeply aware of where it comes from, right? It's no longer just a collection of subsistence level fishermen who also dive for tourist trinkets, but that it's a community that's aware of its history and that has a set of attached cultural practices that are rooted in that history. All right, so finally, there are two kind of linking images that we see running through the whole poem. The first I want to talk about is 
the C Swift, which we mentioned near the beginning of the lecture. Right, so Swift um, is a large seabird um, that resembles a really big swallow. They're not actually related to swallows, but they look a lot like swallows. Uh, they have a kind of cruciform wingspan, so they're often um, used uh, symbolically as a kind of uh, as a kind of Christian symbol, as a religious symbol. They're among the fastest bird species on Earth. You find swifts on every continent. And because of these three qualities, Walcott tends to use them as intermediaries between worlds, right? Between continents, between time periods, between the human and the spirit world, right? So when the swift appears, it's often bringing something from another world. It's bringing a shield back to Africa, right? It's bringing the magic plant that heals Philip Tet um, back to St. Lucia from Africa, so on and so forth. The other linking figure we see is this blind poet, Seven Seas, who appears in many different guises um, throughout the epic. Right? He appears, uh, you know, as a blind, uh, you know, as a blind singing beggar in London. Um, he appears near the end of the poem in the cave as Almoros, that is Homer. And one thing that's interesting is that Walcott gives the name Omeros, the Greek name Omeros, um, a Caribbean etymology, um, where O is the sound suggested by the conch shell, Mare is the sea, which gives life and takes it away, and Os is bone, right, from the Latin. All right, so I hope that this discussion of some of the themes, tropes, and images in the poem gives you some help with it. Um, I know that it is difficult sometimes to piece together exactly what is happening in the poem. So if you have questions as you're reading, just shoot me an email, um, post them onto the discussion board, and I will... I will get to them. Um, <clears throat> so for next week, we're going to be looking at uh, Chinua Achebe's uh, No Longer at Ease. So we'll be leaving the Caribbean behind and looking um, at contemporary African literature. Um, so we'll see you then.